Hi everybody, today we're going to talk about chapter 4, which is about prenatal development and birth. We're going to start with the fact or fiction. Number one, an embryo is a developing human organism between the third and eighth week after conception. That is actually true. Number two, by the end of the third month, the fetus has all of its body parts. This is also true, which is amazing. Number three, teratogens are only a concern for women who use alcohol and drugs. This is not true. There are many other teratogens out in our environment. And number four, all newborn reflexes help a baby survive. This is also not true. Every, not every reflex is about survival. Beginning of pregnancy. Paradoxically, many obstetricians date the onset of pregnancy from the date of the woman's last menstrual period, LMP, about 14 days before conception. So, length of pregnancy, if the LMP is used as the starting time, pregnancy lasts about 40 weeks, sometimes expresses 10 lunar months. A lunar month is about 28 days long. Then there's something called trimesters. Months 1, 2, and 3 are called first trimester. Months 4, 5, and 6, the second trimester and months seven, eight, and nine, the third trimester. And they've also been broken down, sometimes people refer to them as the germinal, embryonic, and fetal period. Babies born between three weeks before and two weeks after the date are considered full term or on time. Babies born earlier are called preterm. Babies born later are called postterm. The words preterm and postterm are more accurate than premature and postmature. And this is about our due dates. The germinal period, also called the germinal stage, is the first two weeks of prenatal development after conception, and it's characterized by rapid cell division and the beginning of cell differentiation. So there you're going to see there's actually an egg being released from the ovary, and it's traveling down the fallopian tube. And conception is occurring within the fallopian tube. And then it's now a zygote, and it's traveling down and the zygote is a single cell form from the union of two gametes, and it starts to duplicate and divide within hours of conception, and then implantation occurs. And implantation is a process beginning about 10 days after conception in which the developing organism nestles in and attaches to the placenta that lines the uterus, and that's when everything the mother does is now being transferred also to the um, developing embryo. So the word embryo is often used loosely, but it's just one of three periods or stages for a developing human prior to birth. The embryonic period, also called the embryonic stage, is a stage of prenatal development from approximately the third through the eighth week after conception, during which the basic forms of all body structures, including internal organs, develop. The critical, this is critical since it's a time when all the support systems form along with the basic organs of the body, including the brain. So this is a um, visual of what happens during the embryonic period. Um, brain, the, um, as the nerves and muscles form links to the brain, the embryo now moves spontaneously as the brain begins to move muscles. Facial features are developing. External sex organs. And overall appearance. The intestines begin to move from the umbilical cord to the embryo's body cavity. And the baby actually starts forming arms, hands, and fingers. And this is the third through the eighth week of pregnancy. And do recall that many women at this stage don't even realize they're pregnant. The fetal period, also called the fetal stage, is the stage of prenatal development from the ninth week after conception until birth during which the fetus gains about 7 pounds, more than 3,000 grams, and organs become more mature, gradually able to function on their own. By the end of the third month, the sex organs are visible via ultrasound, which is also called a sonogram. By 11 weeks, the rough brain structure is complete and all the organ systems are present. At about 22 weeks after conception, the fetus may survive outside of the mother's uterus if specialized medical care is available. This is known as the age of viability. So fetus is a developing human organism from the start of the ninth week after conception until birth.
by day 100, the brain looks distinctly human. By week 28, the brain activity begins and the various sections of the brain are recognizable. When the fetus is full term, parts of the brain, including the cortex, the outer layers, are formed, folding over one another and becoming more convoluted or wrinkled as the number of brain cells increases. So as you can see, the brain's getting larger and larger. During the germinal period, about 60% of natural conceptions and 70% in vitro conceptions do not implant. So these are what they would be called naturally aborted, that they, a woman would just get her period, oftentimes not even realizing that she was pregnant. During the embryotic period, it's critical for many teratogens, which are agents that can result in birth defects or even death. And about 20% of all embryos are aborted spontaneously, most often because of chromosomal abnormalities. About 5% of all fetuses are aborted spontaneously before viability at age 22 weeks or stillborn, defined as born after 22 weeks. And about 31% of all zygotes grow and survive to become living newborn babies. Now, when you think about that statistic, only 31% make it to actually be born. And it's amazing when you think of how many unwanted pregnancies we have out there that only 31% of actually, you know, after conception make it to the end. So risk reduction, protective measures. What are the risks at different stages of development? Since timing of exposure is a crucial factor, preconception health is at least as important as health during pregnancy. For example, one study found that although smoking cigarettes throughout pregnancy can be lethal for the fetus, smokers who quit in the first weeks of pregnancy had no higher risks of complications than did women who never smoked. A situation called threshold effect is one in which a certain teratogen is relatively harmless in small dose, but becomes harmful once exposure reaches a certain level, the threshold. For instance, alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana do more harm in combination, thus lowering the threshold for each in its own. Genes are another factor. When a woman carrying a dizygotic twins drinks alcohol, for example, the twins' blood alcohol levels are equal, yet one twin may be more severely affected than the other, possibly because one twin has an allele that affects the enzyme that metabol metabolizes alcohol. So there are specific critical periods within a pregnancy where if you're exposed to something could cause a child to have some kind of defect. So one of the first ones is something that can harm the central nervous system. If the child's exposed to this teratogen between weeks three and eight, it can cause neural tube defects and mental retardation. However, if they're only exposed to it after 32 weeks of pregnancy, it may only cause learning disability. Same things with things that are... Uh, forming when the heart is forming if you're exposed to teratogen during three and six and a half weeks of pregnancy it can be severely um, hurt the child in their heart functioning while it's less critical if it's after six and a half weeks when the heart's already formed and these are just some more examples of exposure and when the thing so I always blame my mom for this I had um horrible enamel staining so I tell my mom that between six and eight weeks of pregnancy she must have been exposed to something while as if she had if I had only been ex but, but she had been exposed when I was after nine weeks it would have been less critical So benefits of prenatal care, there are tons of them. Um, some tests are non-invasive like those shown here, but other, other tests that, defect, that detect chromosomal abnormalities or other serious problems are invasive, posing greater risks. And one of the reasons why it's so important is that we want to be able to watch the fetus and make sure everything's developing as it should be, because if it's not, there are things we can do to help you, like gestational diabetes we want to check out for, we want to look out for preeclampsia, we want to make sure the fetus is actually growing and has space, amniotic fluid isn't getting low. So in the past, prospective first-time parents often approach birth with a host of fears and negative feelings. Today, women and men are increasingly well-informed and highly positive about the birth of their babies. 
it's not unusual to experience first person accounts celebrating the birth experience. And these are just, it's a kind of a fun slide talking about uh, your friend offering if you, you want to be in the delivery room and how you might feel. And some people love being in the delivery room and some people feel that it's intimate and they don't want to be part of it and they want to wait till it's their own experience. So the newborn, first minutes and complications. The first thing we do when a newborn is born is we check to make sure that they're doing okay. And there's an APGAR scale that assesses the baby's color, heart rate, reflexes, muscle tone, and respiratory effort, and they're given on a score of uh, two. Each time, the total of all five scores is compared with a maximum score of 10, which is rarely attained. So it's basically a quick assessment of the baby's health. So some complications, anoxia, which is a complication of birth due to lack of oxygen. Three of the five criteria on the APGAR scale monitor the potential for this condition. There's something called cerebral palsy, a condition based on brain damage related to movement control. It used to be considered a result of problem birth procedures, but it's more often related to genetic vulnerability, worsened by teratogens or maternal illness. And I just love the image of this infant just looking at the, the camera and actually looking so alert as a newborn. So there's variations in birth weight. Low birth weight may be the result of an illness in mother or fetus, maternal drug use or smoking or maternal malnutrition. This is a worldwide challenge. For example, 3% of babies born in nations of North Europe are low birth weight, but 30% of babies born in nations of South Asia weigh less than 2,500 grams. Also, the United States has a distressing incidence of infant mortality, primarily because of low birth weight. Some low birth weight babies survive and become over, overcome early problems if they receive excellent early care in the hospital and then at home. On the other hand, very low birth weight babies are later to smile, hold a bottle, walk, and communicate. As the months go by, cognitive difficulties as well as visual and hearing impairments may emerge. And as a result, adults and as and as adults, some risks persist for low birth weight babies, including ironically higher rates of obesity, heart disease, and diabetes. So low birth weight is a body weight at birth of less than five and a half pounds. Very low birth weight is a body weight at birth of less than three pounds. And extremely low birth weight is a body weight at birth of less than two pounds. And there are infants who are born less than two pounds who survive. So reflexes. Earlier you noticed that we were discussing that um, there are Reflexes that can help an infant survive, but they don't need all the reflexes to survive. The breathing and sucking reflexes are necessary for child survival. However, some reflexes aren't necessary, but they indicate the state of the brain and body functions. As you can see, stepping reflex is when you hold a baby upright and their feet make a stepping motion. You can also see the Moro reflex when a baby flings its arms outward and then brings them together on its chest as it cries with eyes wide open. Those are not survival reflexes. However, they do let us know that neurologically things are going well in the infant. So what's the father's role? We talk, you know, when we talk about pregnancy, it's all about the mother and just, you know, being pregnant. And basically this is showing pictures of a father being supportive and that fathers can be crucial during prenatal development and a newborn's life. And some fathers experience something called cuvade, which is symptoms of pregnancy and birth experienced by fathers. So they'll actually get um, morning sickness. So this wraps up Chapter 4. Please go to the form section and respond to the question about birth. Thanks.